Right, I'm here with Jeremy Ford, who has had a really exciting weekend. Okay, so quick background for everybody. We all just like happened to be getting coffee at the same time, right? That's when well, you and I ran into each like other. <laughs> we were getting coffee, but um, I kind of just crashed the press room because it said press and I just kind of felt like, well, I'm real press. You are press. Right. So I thought I'd just peek around and come in and see what's going on. So that's kind of, you know, and as I walked in, they kind of look around, we happen to meet and then you got a tidbit of my story. Yes. So, okay. So let's hear about your story. First of all, when he says he's real press, that's because like no they're real press too everybody but. else's day job is like oh i you know i serve coffee or i work at a desk and he's a television news reporter <laughs> right so i'm I, I actually do right now in um meridian mississippi um i'm a tv news reporter for twin states news and um so that's Twin States means Alabama and Mississippi, mm -hmm. and um, I do news for NBC, Fox, and CBS. That's awesome. And before that, um, in Los Angeles, I was an entertainment reporter. Nice. For okay. free. For free? <laughs> yeah, I was a poor entertainment reporter. But okay. we'll get to that. <laughs> uh, all right. So, all right. So you are. It's weird having you know us. We've got our press badges. We have these two different sides of the media industry side by side at film festivals because you have the photographers and the videographers, and then people like me reporting, you know, here in the press room at the red carpet. And then we've got people that we sat next to in school that we we're talking about. You know, the filmmakers are on the other side of the velvet ropes, so to speak. So it's interesting vibe here at film festivals it's kind of like we all know the same thing but we're all we're here in different about. aspects of yes. it yeah you know for me um i went to film school at uh, loyola marymount in los angeles mm -hmm. and um fortunately i think the people that were going to make it have probably already made it i'm probably like you know but we all know that it takes 10 years to become an overnight success so there you, go. you know that's just kind of kind of kind of the route and the journey but it's great to see that a lot of other people here whether you knew them before or not um everyone's here collectively to try to get their project made or get their project out there and that's why it's so positive and the positive vibes are all throughout the festival that's awesome okay so you went to loyal marymount what did you do next um so um after uh, as an undergraduate mm -hmm. i went to school for broadcast journalism okay so um in chicago and so i was like ah and my took my first job in chicago at jerry springer so I was like, oh, nice. okay, I really like TV. I really like this business. Mm -hmm. Then I applied um, for, graduate, for graduate school and got into Loyola Marymount, went out to LMU, hadn't seen it, and it was just kind of reckless. Like I just drove out there and um, it's kind of like the beginning of, of you know, kind of who I am. Like I drove out, I hadn't visited the school. Um, they didn't have graduate housing. So I slept in my car at the parking garage at the university. Oh, man. Um, oh yeah, it was, it was but, but I was in film school and that's all that mattered. So um, after that, I was working in reality television. Um, I was either a writer, um, associate producer and stuff for, for different reality TV shows. Real World, World Rules, Make of the Band, Biggest Loser, um, a bunch of different shows. Um, so I did that for a long time. But we all know that you'll work on a great show for three or four months and then you'll have no job for three or four months. Right. And you still have to survive. And that's what makes it tough. So right after school, I was actually bouncing around and um, trying to make my own films. Mm -hmm. um, and I made two independent features, um, but also um, really writing and working for other people. Uh, tell us a little bit about your independent features. Like what were your early storytelling interests? Well, um, I decided that um, the first thing that I should do is, is make a documentary mm -hmm. because you the, know, the journalism aspect exactly for sure. and, and it's cheaper it's cheaper I mean you could shoot a documentary on your iPhone now absolutely um, so I thought oh I'd make a documentary so I did a documentary that had some distribution it's called the road to Sturgis um, it's a rock and roll documentary about a rock band that wants to play at the largest motorcycle rally in the world and so I went on tour with them for three months of the summer mm -hmm. and traveled with them think like almost famous like I kind of lived that for a summer sure and so I did that documentary and got distribution so it was like oh yay you know I thought everything was gonna be great but you're only as good as your last project <laughs> <laughs> so um, I worked on other shows and toyed around um, and then I wrote a screenplay uh, for a for a narrative um, called mischievous souls 
um, it was like a um, it was just really cool you know I, I shot it on um, three different formats on um, Super 8 um, color and black and white um, and on 16 um, and so it was, it was a skateboard um, narrative about a group of LA skateboarders okay. that um, it's a, it was a day in the life and um, one of them ends up accidentally killing someone and they've got it on camera and um, so it's about the camaraderie and friendship that skateboarders have because a lot mm -hmm. of people don't know that like when you skateboard you like take off in the morning mm -hmm. and you're gone all day with your buds like all day skateboarding and going to different spots you know and so much happens throughout the course of a day mm -hmm. and so that was the film so I finished the film and it was on 16 and stuff and it's still done and I never released it I know I know I know. The fu okay, future project. Well, yeah, you're gonna done. come back to that. I said one day when like the big one comes out, like I'll do what um, Craig Brewer did. You mm -hmm. know, Hustle and Flow. Um, he did an independent, um, a black and white independent film, I believe it was. And um, after Hustle and Flow came out and he won and all the stuff, yeah, he ended up giving away his, you know, so people could see like his beginning work. And I said that's what I'll do. Like that's when amazing. hopefully when Last American Lynching comes out, then I'm like. Oh, but wait a minute, that little film that he did a long time ago, if you guys haven't seen it, here it, you know, is. Right, here it is, I'll let you see it, so yeah. I like that. Yeah. I like, okay, so somewhere in there, like you said, you were an entertainment, entertainment news journalist. Yeah. So did that come next after your features? Yeah, so I did a couple of the features, and um, like I said, one came out, and the other one, um, I just kind of never really submitted the film. But you know. will, you'll but see I, it. Yeah, at some point, I'll, I'll put it out there. Um, and then in between that, I, I would go through what we all go through in the industry. Um, you know, I would go out to, I was in LA, and I'm like, oh, I can't do this anymore, and I'd go home for three, four months. And then something would push me, and I'd go back. Sure. You know what I mean? And try it again, and then get a job. And then I'd be broke, so I'd go back home. So I, I did that a few times, and um, um, then eventually, um, I was on one of my home journeys, and um, I'd been pitching The Last American Lunch. I'd been pitching the idea of it to friends. Okay. And everyone kept saying, you have to write this thing. You have to write it. And so um, I just camped out on my girlfriend's couch at the time um, and um, wrote in two weeks, shelled this thing out. And, um, and, then, I, and then afterwards, I let people read it. And I kind of knew I had something when I... Um, I would let people read it, mm -hmm. and they would visibly cry in front of me while reading the script. And I was like, okay, I'm onto something here. Yes. And so that was like the beginning stages of, of like, okay, I think I have something. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to ask me, how did you get here? So, yeah. <laughs> I'll help you out. So what ended up happening was I went to a Blacklist event, mm -hmm. and um, while I was there, I met my writing partner. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's... it's it, Blacklist, that the Blacklist Happy Hour event is AFF okay. once a month in Los Angeles. Nice. So it's basically networking for filmmakers and writers mm -hmm. um, once a month. So there, that's when I, where I met Tom. And, you know, I was like, oh, what do you have? Like, here, I mean, what do you have? What do you have? And I told him the story. He said, this sounds amazing. Let me read it. So I sent it to him. And he was like, this is great. But. It's not like Hollywoodable. I can help you with that. And so we talked, and um, I listened to his ideas, and I was like, okay. Make it a little so, more shootable. Right, right. And so we worked together. He cleaned it up, and um, we went back and forth. And um, then I got my now job as a TV news reporter, left L.A., and then Tom did what he did, and he calls me up about six weeks ago and says, hey, guess what? We're semi-finalists in Austin. I was like, what? Is that a big deal? He's like, hell yeah, it's a big deal. <laughs> so, yeah, so the journey. Uh, let's see, it's not on here. But anyway, our logo is there, the lovely the typewriter lovely type here. Writer, right. So, yeah, this is the Writers Festival. Right, right. And so I, I knew that I had to come. So I, I came down, and me and Tom both came, and it's been a whirlwind. It's been amazing. Yeah. Um, you know, we've been fortunate enough to have uh, representation seek us out. And here yeah at the festival yeah at the wow. festival and things like that so um you know we just ha happen to be lucky enough that you know i guess the script is good or it wouldn't be a semi-finalist script uh but outside of that um i really think that the time is now 
for the for last American story. Legion. Yeah, like like with everything that's happened. And then I leave here yesterday and find out. Well, at some point, I need to tell them what the story is about, right? Yeah, let's talk about it. Let's talk about the story, The Last American Lynching. Okay, so The Last American Lynching is um, the story of an African-American woman mm -hmm. that ends up taking ownership of the Ku Klux Klan. So, true story, set in 1983. Okay. Um, so, what happens is, um, in 1981, um, the Ku Klux Klan, the Alabama, United Clans of America, the Alabama Ku Klux Klan, so the baddest of the bad, the same guys that the beat the Freedom South. Riders, yeah, that, that bombed 16th Baptist Church and killed the, the four little, little girls, girls yeah. yeah. So um, this organization ended up saying, or, or the vice president um, sent his son and his son's friend to go and lynch a random black person. And so they go out and um, they find Michael Donald who was walking to the store to buy some cigarettes for his aunt and they abduct him and lynch him. Um, the next day, uh, when everyone notices him hanging in the street dead, um, you know, the cops get involved and say, oh, it must have been a drug deal gone wrong. So they sweep everything under the rug, right. Um, his mother was like, wait a minute, my son was, worked at the newspaper, the local newspaper. My son uh, was in college to be a brick mason, like he was a good kid. So his mother fought for justice mm -hmm. in her son's name. In doing so, she eventually got, you know, lawyers and the FBI involved and got them to come in town and reopen up the case. And turns out that one of the Klansmen that did it uh, confessed and ended up going to prison, of course. And she ends up suing the organization the Ku Klux Klan because they ordered it for wrongful death for wrongful death ends up winning that lawsuit seven million dollars they can't afford it so they have to turn over their records their deed their national headquarters and the whole nine and she ends up owning the whole organization and then in 86 she becomes woman of the year she dies in 87 wow. and then the film ends in 96 when the other guy that did it, mm -hmm. the son of the vice president of the United Clans of America, ends up getting the electric chair in 96 wow. for the murder, becoming the second man in the state of Alabama, white man, to get the electric chair for killing someone black. The first one was in 1913. Um, and then right before he goes in and gets killed, there's a black minister that has to you know, pray over him. Wow. He ends up confessing the truth oh and gets, you know, fried. So that's the last American lynching. So the story of it is true, of course. It's mm -hmm. all true and, and it's all based on a true story. And um, the time is now. So, you know, when you think of what's happening in America now, we think about what's happening in Charlottesville. When you think about what happened yesterday, there was a White Lives Matter march in Tennessee the same guys that did the Charlottesville. Charlottesville and it ended up they did it they were supposed to do it twice it got shut down and it was a whole big deal so the time is now and, and I think like I said the script must have been pretty good I think the story is amazing but more so than anything like this is something that people need to know about Okay, so obviously, you know, the film has not been made yet, no. but how are people already reacting to the story? Oh, it's been great. So um, we've had a few big companies um, come in and, 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 and do their uh, general meeting, um, which is really cool. So for those of you that don't know, the way the representation thing works is um, when they find your work, they're like, great, great. Like, this is a great writer. Um, the next step is a general meeting. Why? Because it's a marriage. They want to make sure that they can work with you. Mm -hmm. So it's basically a sit down and who are you? Like, what is your story? What are you about? And within that, it's also what else do you got? Because this is great. And what do you have in the vaults? Exactly. So um, we went through the general meeting process and um, uh, the one company that we want to go with, um, they're a big company and, and they're great. Um, and so now the next step is they're going back to LA after this and they're gonna More meetings, send everything out yeah. well, within the company to find out which um, agent manager will work best with us and then we'll go out and meet with them and definitely sign with them 
<laughs> and right, and then um, and then move things through. So um, you know, hopefully the process will be a lot faster than mm -hmm. um, it took for me to um, get it done. You know what I mean? Like yeah. as far as get it done, as far as the 15 years of, of struggling in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. You know. So let's talk a little bit more, you know, deeper about this screenplay. You're a journalist by trade. You know, you have a degree in it. So how much did that help you when you were? Uh, looking at this material and bringing all the facts forward about this case? Um, I think it helped in the sense as to where I've, I was never a good student. Like, I was good enough to get by. I was an mm -hmm. athlete, actually. So, so I, I never made bad grades, but, you know, I, I was like, oh, a C's cool. Like, it's not an F. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not an A, but I don't care about an A, right? So... It helped in a sense as to where when I'm excited about something, I'm 1,000% all in. And so um, as a journalist um, or a writer, um, I ended up saying, oh, this is a great story. Then I dove in. So um, it was an article that I read, um, and then um, I talked to people that were involved, and then I got the court documents of what really happened in the courtroom, and then I was like, ah. So then I camped out on the couch for like two weeks and wrote the whole thing. How did the people who were involved feel about talking to you about this? Well, a lot of them that I spoke with weren't like, they're just sitting, because it's 83. Sure. And, and um, the woman, Beulah May, the, the She passed in, in She's passed, and she was, yeah, and she was older then. So everyone's a lot older, but um, like the Alabama, the uh, state of Alabama historian that I spoke to that mm -hmm. had documented stuff and and things like that and and I speak spoken with some of the um, descendants nieces and nephews and things like that um, and as of right now um, people have told me or they've told me that you know it's a they want to put the story out there they want to be told correctly sure but they do want people to know um, you know the story and keep the legacy alive and the positivity of it I like that Okay, so I'm gonna ask what the Hollywood execs are asking. What else is in the vault? Oh, uh, you know what's crazy? That you can talk about. I, I know that oh, I can talk about anything. You're not supposed I can talk about to. anything. By, by the time this gets to you in the next couple of days, I'll have it written already. So, no, um, <laughs> what's crazy? Two weeks. Right, two, two weeks, weeks for that two screenplay. Weeks. Right, so, you know, I, I write really quickly. Um, uh, what can I tell you? Um, I've got some ideas. I've met with a lot of people here um, and just kind of pitched off the cuff and found that they were um, uh, really excited. But the, the idea was when I leave here, mm -hmm. I said, I'm going to know what I'm going to write next. And um, this morning, <laughs> I started uh, working on um, an erotic thriller. Oh. An erotic thriller, right. So. Um, yeah, I don't know if I'm supposed to tell you or if you really want to know what it's about. But, um, <laughs> you can share whatever you feel comfortable sharing. Well, um, I will say that if you liked Seven, okay. if you liked Basic Instinct, then you will love this movie. It's a smart thriller centered around a family. It's got a strong psychological element. Right, right. If you liked Gone Girl... Oh, okay. Um, these you'll you'll love this movie. That movie mess with my head. Yeah, and this one will too. Okay. So, <laughs> so, so, so you premiering know. in next year's Dark Matters category. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and I, I and that was the goal. The goal was, um, you know, I'm a semifinalist. I can't go backwards. So it's like, oh, if I come back, or no, when I come back to AFF, I have go. to be a finalist. Like, you know, that's the goal. So um, I decided that I'm gonna go five for five in the mm -hmm. next five years. I'm gonna submit five different screenplays and and see what happens because I don't want to go backwards I don't want to just be a second rounder and that's Smart fine goals. and that's cool but the goal now is that can I win this thing can I like you know so, yes so we'll see how it goes okay just curious so um, obviously this is something that'll be worked out within the next few weeks next few months but had you thought about directing your screenplay yourself absolutely I spent a lot of money to go to Loyola Marymount University for them to tell me that I know how to direct the film and so the things I write I <laughs> mission would love, accomplished. I would love to direct right um, but yeah because um, writing comes from um, things that I feel that I want to see and even with my writing partner 
um, he knows that when I put something down, a lot of it's um, really descriptive. And he'll throw a lot of that away because it's like, yeah, but you know, when we're sitting this out, you know, um, they don't want to see all that. You know, they don't want to read all that, you know. And, and, and we know as writers, you're not supposed to have camera angles and blah, blah, blah. And I don't do that, so to speak, but I, when people read it, as a director, mm -hmm. I tend to write what I see. Sure. And that can somewhat be very um, taxing or touching to someone that's reading those words because I'm, I am very descriptive with how I paint that picture. Mm -hmm. And um, so I want to direct everything for the most part that I write. Mm -hmm. um, I want to direct other people's stuff, but more so than anything, I like knowing that, oh, I can write something well. And I want to prove to you next that, yes, I can direct something as well. Well, I, I feel like you being a director and you, the way that you put it, you know, you write what you see can only be helpful because, you know, one of the things that we talked about, I went to film school and one thing that we talked about in screenwriting class was, you know, our professor would say, so many of you have these amazing ideas, you know, you don't understand, like what is shootable and what's not like what can you accomplish on film not to say that we shouldn't push the boundaries mm -hmm. of that but uh for a writer that is unfamiliar with that i think that would be yeah that could be well, a real obstacle well, i'll tell you how it works for me um and people are saying well how did you write the last american lynching in two weeks um before i sat down to put a word on the page mm -hmm. i have this weird thing where I can literally watch my movie in my head. So I've worked out so much of it because I've had times where I'll just lay in bed, like, you know that morning grog that you get when you're like, you're still half dead sleep, but you're awake and you know you're supposed to get up, but you're still laying there? Yeah. Like, something will weigh heavy on me, and if I'm thinking about something or a project, like, I can watch, like, I can watch the whole, like, it's crazy. And so it the makes internal it, edit is turned off. It, exactly. So it makes it easy for me to shell things out because, you know, I've seen, like, if it's, if it's this powerful scene, I've seen in my head how it works, how it would work on film. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? So it's, it makes it easy for me, you know, to write it. What's the vibe you're envisioning with this? Like, Last American Lynching? Yes. Um, the, the, the cool thing is that it's not a black film, it's not a white film, it's a film that everyone needs to see. Mm -hmm. um, secondly, The Last American Lynching isn't a film like, you know, a, a lot of stuff has done really well and won a lot of awards, so we'll, we'll, you'll think back like, oh, but Django, and, and oh, but 12 Years a Slave, and, and a lot of these films, are, or Birth of a Nation, sure. a lot of these good films, but they, they all took place in the 1900s, like so long ago. This film is today. Mm -hmm. So what you got when you may have seen um, Straight Outta Compton, mm -hmm. early 80s, is great. but felt like it was now. Yes. Because what they incorporated, the police brutality, it felt like now. That's this film. This film is 1983. It ends in 1996. Mm -hmm. Like, you feel like, you know, or I was alive, or I know some of them alive, or my parents remember this, like, like the era. And so the whole vibe is, it's timeless. Mm -hmm. It's timeless, but it's relevant to everything that's happening today. That's right now. And that's what's crazy about it. What is your response? Because I know that when this movie is released, like, people will ask this question. Uh, what is your response to people that, I imagine, are going to say, can we just... Let the past, let it die. Just, you know, let's not think about it. Um, I think that... Which I think is a very bad idea for the record. <laughs> right. But, but, but I think that history, um, we all, you know, it, it's kind of like with what was going on here recently with, though, you know, the flag and the Confederate flag mm -hmm. or um, the Confederate statues. And, and, but before that, it was, oh, Black Lives Matter, just, you know brush it on the rug, let it die. Um, oh, but then when it came down to taking down Confederate monuments, it was like, well, wait a minute, we're preserving our history. Yes. Um, then history is important. Right, right. <laughs> so, so this is what I think. I think, you know, 
as people right now, we're kind of divided, and, and there's a lot of um, division in race and 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 sexism as well with women trying to get you know be equal and things like that mm -hmm. i my answer is this film needs to be made and people need to see it because if people especially white people want to know mm -hmm. how to fix this problem the answer is open dialogue so when i say that to you i say i would say to my white friends you know it's like oh well, jeremy blah blah and i'm like listen i know about you I grew up around white people. I watched all your movies. Like, I was the only black person in class, or, or whatever the case. The issue is that you don't know about me or my people. I would agree with that. So, when you want to fix these problems, understand, well, I don't understand why uh, black girls don't swim. Well, get a black female friend and touch her hair and understand her hair texture and see why. I don't understand why black people don't play hockey. Well, understand that what it costs to play hockey and all the equipment. But they're so good at basketball. A crate and a ball. Right? Mm -hmm. So, that's why. But they're so good at football. Have you ever met a person that has had to pay for football equipment other than a cup and a mouthpiece? Yeah. No. This is the USA. Exactly. <laughs> so, so, my point is, the open dialogue, and that's this film. Mm -hmm. This film is the Klan, and this film is black people. And this film is what happened to those guys with white sheets and hoods. Why, why now? I don't know. What were they? Alt-right, nationalists, mm -hmm. supremacists. Why are all these names happen now and not Ku Klux Klan? Yeah. Because... Rebranding, as SNL put it. <laughs> right. Exactly. Because this is the story of what happened then. And they don't want to tell you that a black woman... Let's, let's be honest. Literally owns The them. lowest of the low on the... On their totem pole. But in the United States, it was white man, white woman, black man, black woman. Mm -hmm. Turns around and becomes the most powerful. You know? So heroism. And we often hear, oh, there's not enough movies for black people or black women and things like that. But this movie, this she... You know what I mean? It's about that fight and the struggle. And this movie, when you leave uh, or you read the script, this is what opens up that dialogue with, you know, that's pretty effed up, mm -hmm. you know? And I understand why this happened or that happened, but I want to do my part as a person, not as a white person or a black person, but as a person to get to know you. You know what I mean? To get to know. I don't hate black people. I may not like Tyrone because he's a dick. <laughs> but I don't not like black people, you know, I may not like Juan, you know, mm -hmm. because he's, he was a bully. But I can't not like Mexicans, and that's collectively how we should be, you know. Black people shouldn't say, I don't like white people. Like, that's just, it's all just stupid. So, it opens the dialogue for us all to say, hey, you know, collectively, let's understand each other so we can all move forward. Yeah. Well, I really... On that note, I appreciate you being willing to have this conversation with me, knowing that, you know, I don't understand a lot of the history. I'm ignorant to so much mm -hmm. of it, you know, and up till probably a year ago, I don't know why it was that, because I'm not a football fan, I don't know why it was that Colin, Colin Kaepernick. Kaepernick was the one to actually make me think about things. Right. Because, like I said, I, I really don't care about football, sorry. Mm -hmm. But, um, well, you know. But something about seeing him doing that, I was, I just had a moment of, and I didn't even consciously think it, like, maybe I should start listening here. Right. Well, I just think um, in that situation, and this isn't a political forum, this is a filmmaker's forum. It's all good. But in that situation, I think in, in relation to what we're doing here today is you have to, as myself, mm -hmm. like what Colin did, you have to take the powers that be, your voice, yeah. and put it out there. Some people may listen, some may not. Some may agree, some may not. But you can't be afraid to share your voice. I can't be afraid, I've heard this. What would Klansmen do to you if they know that you're gonna tell the story of the demise of those three letters. I don't care. I'm here to tell a story. 
And that's what matters. And if you listen, then you're there to learn a little bit. Yeah. At least be entertained. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But what better way, say what Colin Kaepernick did, what better way in our world to bring white people and black people together than a film about the epitome of white people and black people. I love it. I love it and I'm excited to see it and read it. I want to just read the screenplay. I'll get it to you. And then you'll just, whenever you feel like it, have me back and we'll Yes. Share. And then hold and then me, when hold the red me carpet to, hold happens. Hold me to it. Hold me to it. <laughs> Don't hold me to all that. Like when it happens, because that's the cool thing about being here in Austin. Like it's all been great for me and mm -hmm. on its way to happening and so when it does don't act like you're not my friend be like jeremy can bring it you know and and we'll make something special happen i will like, hold you, you know? to that um, i'm with it all right thank you for coming no problem thank you so much thank you for having me and uh hopefully you guys are here for me soon and i'll be back next year I'll, I'll yes excited to see you again <laughs> right all right thanks so for much five years coming five years five years in the competition. Ah, five years